Hello and welcome back to the live stream. Today we are going to be looking at everybody's favourite little bomb chucker and healer, the Alchemist. So, yes, thank you for joining. It's been a while since I've done a live stream. We've had a nice big pandemic hit. I think everybody's aware of that. We've had a couple of birthdays and yeah, it's been a bit of time not being able to live stream as we've been running around doing parental stuff. So today we are looking at the Alchemist. We are going to basically be looking at whoop, what key abilities they have, which is intelligence. We're effectively looking at how to build an Alchemist. We're going to do a deep dive into the Alchemist. We're going to do one character build, what races are really good for it, what ancestries, what heritages, what backgrounds, that sort of stuff. So the Alchemist, key ability score is Intelligence. This is going to basically do your class DC, and the class DC kind of helps a lot with different things. Your Medic, you can use your class DC, um, or your, not the class DC, you use your, what is that one? You use another DC for healing. Um, most of the time it goes for Wisdom, but if you have higher crafting, which you should have been a much higher intelligent creature, or player, you're going to be able to use your intelligence for that. Um, poisoners use a much higher DC based off their intelligence, so they can, you know, hit creatures with lower D, uh, hit creatures with a higher DC than the standard weaker poisoning. Um, your secondary abilities will be Constitution and Dexterity. This is going to keep you alive and let you sample some of your poisons without actually taking damage, as well as give you your armor class, as you're not kind of based on strength that much. You're going to be trained in perception, train, uh, expert in fortitude, expert in reflex, and trained in willpower. You will have crafting as your primary ability, and you'll have, oh, perception, sorry. Perception, you are also trained in perception. You'll have training in crafting in three plus your intelligence. You'll be trained in simple weapons and alchemical bombs and light and medium armor and trained in the alchemist class DC. So with alchemy, you get a couple of um, things when you choose an alchemist. You understand the complex interactions of natural and unnatural substances and can conto uh, concoct alchemical items to meet all your needs. When you do this, you use normal reagents and the crafting activity, or you can use a special infused reagent that allows you to craft temporary items at no cost. So you get the alchemical crafting feat. Usually you would have to choose this as a, um, as a skill feat. And it says even if you don't meet the feat's prerequisites, but alchemists automatically get crafting, so you do meet it. Um, you also gain four common first level formulas granted by that feat. You get infused reagents, so this is another thing that your intelligence pings off. Basically, you get at the start of your day with your daily preparations, you get a number of infused batches equal to your level plus your intelligence modifier. So level one, that should be sitting at five. You can use these reagents for advanced alchemy or quick alchemy. So advanced alchemy is during your daily preparations after producing new reagents, you can spend batches of those reagents to create infused alchemical items. For each batch you spend, choose an alchemical item in your advanced alchemy level or lower that's in your formula book and make two of them. So that basically means instead of, um, you know, one reagent equals one bomb, you can craft two bombs for one. So at level one this is going to give you ten different items if you use advanced alchemy. The other thing to look out for is every particular research path will give you kind of like a uh, spontaneous sorcerer's um, signature spells. It will effectively give you a signature recipe where you make three of them. So if you're a healer, you can make three elixirs of life with one reagent. So it's pretty good economy with, economy with that. You also get Quick Alchemy, which basically gives you the Quick Alchemy action, and you can use your infused reagents to quickly craft anything you want. Now the Quick Alchemy action, it is an alchemist um, tag, and it's manipulate, so it will cause attacks of opportunity. 
you use one batch of infused reagents and you have the formula for the alchemical item you're creating. You must have that and you are either wearing your alchemist tools or holding them. Um, there is a note in the core rulebook that says any tools you don't have to have inside a pouch. You can just have it on your person. So it's basically attached to your belt or attached to your bandolier, something like that. You don't have to put it in there. It just counts as being active. And when you do that, you can create a single alchemical item that you could normally create. Um, it basically remains potent until the start of your next turn. So you can quickly make a healing potion and then toss it to one of your allies. And as long as they use it before your next turn, it's still a valid healing potion. Right, so research fields. This is the subclasses for the alchemists. We have four of them. We have the bomber, where you specialize in explosives and other violent alchemical reactions. So you start the formula with two alchemical bombs in your formula book in addition to the four you usually get. And those two that you choose will be your signature recipes, meaning you can create three of them. Um, when throwing an al alchemical bomb, the special bonus is if it has splash damage, you can deal splash damage to only your primary target instead of the AOE. So if you have an acid bomb that does one persistent or one d4 persistent splash damage, you can throw it. The target will get one d4 persistent splash damage. But if your fighter is right next to that target, you know, wailing on them, they're not going to take the damage. So very, ha uh, very, very handy with that. Next one is the Shurgeon. You concentrate on healing others with alchemy. You start with a formula of two of the following formula books in addition to all your others. And the three you can choose two of is Lesser Antidote, which is for, I think Antidote is for poisons, Lesser Antiplague, which is for diseases, and the Minor Elixir of Life. The core rulebook first printing had the Lesser Elixir of Life, but that is level three feet so you can't use that at level one and as long as you are proficient in medicine um, as long as your proficiency tr in medicine is trained or better you can attempt a craft and check instead of a medicine check for any of the medicines untrained and trained uses so this means you want to heal someone with a healer's kit well if you only have two wisdom and you're trained then you're only going to sit at a plus five at level one however if you you should be trained in your um, in crafting, so that's going to give you a plus seven. That's going to help out with healing a lot more, and the difference is going to go a lot higher the higher the level you are. The next one is a mutagenist, so you focus on bizarre mutagenic transformations that sacrifice one aspect of a creature's physical or psychological being in order to strengthen another. So you start with two formulas of first level, same as everything else, and you get the mutagenic flashback feat action. We'll have a look at that a little in detail, but this is basically if you want to be Geralt of River, Rivian, River, Riven, something like that. If you want to be a witcher, you go a mutagenist. And a toxicologist. So this here is basically dealing with poisons, venoms, and all that sort of stuff. You start with um, two common first level alchemical poisons which once again you can make three of with your standard thing and you can apply an injury poison that you're uh, holding so an injury poison is basically any poison that doesn't have to be ingested um, you can apply that to a weapon as a single action rather than a two action also you can change the dc of your infused poisons to your class dc which bounces off your intelligence rather than your the poison DC. Um, this will help if you want to infest someone with a bit of arsenic poison at level 20. Obviously they're going to have a 20 fortitude minimum, um, whereas the DC for arsenic I believe is 17, so they're just going to pass, guaranteed pretty much. With this you can use your class DC which is going to be much much higher. All right, so let's have a close look at the bomber. So the reason you get alchemical bombs as an action is because an alchemical bomb is actually a martial ranged weapon. Um, if you didn't have it, you wouldn't be able to throw alchemical bombs because alchemists only get standard weapons or simple weapons, not martial. 
its price obviously varies depending on the bomb its damage will vary depending on the bomb and its range is 20 feet it takes one hand to throw and the weapon traits vary so we can have a look at one here this is alchemist fire it starts at level one every few levels you can get a, another one so you know you get a level three alchemist fire will do more damage and its tags are alchemical bomb consumable fire and splash those count as the weapon traits and the bomb will deal 1d8 fire damage, 1 persistent fire damage, and 1 fire splash damage. So using the bomber feat, if you throw this at a target surrounded by your opponents, then the target is going to take 1d8 fire damage, 1 persistent fire damage, and 1 splash damage. Nobody else is going to take it. And with this, you have um, the following feats which will help you build a bomber so level one you have far lobber and you have quick bomber far lobber lets you throw 30 feet instead of 20 and quick bomber basically lets you pull a bomb out and throw it in one action instead of having to take an action to pull it and then an action to throw level two you're going to get demolition charge so you can attach a bomb to something rig up some fuse wire and light it instead of throwing it you're also going to get a smoke bomb so all your bombs create smoke um, a smoke effect which gives concealment you're going to do calculated splash you can reduce the splash damage if you want um, this is by your intelligence level so you know you can still keep a certain amount say you have a fighter that is resistant for to fire damage and you've got something that is a weakness to fire damage say a cold a white dragon you throw this you can reduce the fire splash damage on a high level one down so it is only doing four fire damage your fight is not going to take any fire damage but the uh, white dragon will take fire damage which will ping its weakness to fire you then ha can make a healing bomb so you can turn elixirs into bombs and then throw them 30 feet away so you want an aoe heal cloud you can quickly make a elixir into a bomb throw it into your frontline troops and heal both of them level six you're going to get debilitating bomb so bombs can debilitate that will give them a certain thing like blindness deafness uh, flat-footed that sort of stuff i think you choose whichever one you want and you can angle the splash damage so you can throw a bomb and make it only do splash damage on one side targeting the enemy not targeting your allies level eight you get sticky bomb so bombs will now do persistent damage if they already done persistent damage then it will double the persistent damage level 10 you get expanded splash doubling the splash damage and you get great debilitating bomb um, basically upping the amount of options you have to choose from Level 12, you have uncanny bombs. You can now throw 50 feet, uh, 60 feet away. You have true debilitating bomb at level 14. This is going to give you the ability to double the amount of damage. So if it was doing blindness one, it'll now do blindness blindness two. I need T. <laughs> you get explosive bomb, which basically, sorry, exploitive bomb. This falls the resistance of people who might have a resistance. So you're firing a alchemist. Al alchemist fire at a red dragon you can ignore its fire resistance you now have perfect debilitation basically an upgrade to the other debilitating bombs and level 20 you have mega bomb which basically makes an awesome bomber now a mutagenist mutagenists basically are your witches you inhale a toxic or an elixir and it will change your body so different things you have oh first off you get mutagenic flashback so a mutagenic flashback you can use it once per day as a free action you experience a brief resurgence of a mutagen choose one mutagen you've consumed since your last daily preparation and you get the effects for that for another minute you then have the following different types of mutagens available at level one bestial mutagen which gives bonus to damage and athletic skill checks Cheetah's elixir, bonus to your speed. Cognitive mutagen, bonus to intelligent checks. Eagle eye elixir, bonus to perception. Juggernaut mutagen, bonus to hit points and recovery. Leaper's elixir, you can jump faster and further. Quicksilver mutagen, bonus to dexterity checks. 
Serene Mutagen, bonus to Wisdom checks. Silver Tongue is bonus to Charisma. And Draycart Mutagen is a bonus to Armor Class and Perception. I'll probably recommend that over Eagle Eye, but yeah. So the feats available, level 2, you have Reviving Mutagen. So this will heal any time you use a Mutagen. However, once you do it, the Mutagen stops in your body. The side effects still kick in, but the actual main effect stops. You have Feral Mutagen, which is an upgrade to Bestial. Elastic, which is an upgrade to Quicksilver. Extended Elixir makes the duration longer. Invincible Mutagen upgrades to Juggernaut Mutagen. Level 14 is Glub Mutagen, upgrade to Silver Tongue. Level 16 is Genius Mutagen, upgrade to Cognitive. Persistent Mutagen, extend your flashback period. Um, and Eternal Elixir, basically make a mutagen permanent. It makes a elixir that has a timed effect into a permanent one until your daily preparation. This counts for mutagens as mutagens are technically an elixir. And level 18, Mind Blank, which is an upgrade to Serene Mutagen. And the final one is level 20, Perfect Mutagen. You no longer suffer all the side effects. So, Ashurgan, you basically have access to, uh, you can use your crafting to give you access, or well not access, to do first aid checks. So, if you're trained in medicine, you can take battle medicine, forensic acumen, inoculation, risky surgery, godless healing, and mortal healing, you're going to be able to use all those abilities with crafting. If you go an expert in medicine, then you can get continual recovery, robust recovery, and ward medic. If you wanted, you can go all the way up to legendary in medicine to get a legendary medic. It is going to help you as a healer, but you'll still find your intelligence modifier will be more powerful than your wisdom modifier. So you can still use all of your um, crafting feats on this instead. That includes, I believe, if you have a plus one for specialty crafting and alchemical, you're going to get a plus one for healing. So the different feats you can get, there's not as much as the other two. Level four, you have the healing bomb. Basically, yep, you can convert a healing potion into a bomb. You have level 6 combined elixirs, make one elixir with two effects. This can go with your mutagenist as well, so you can drink two mutagens at once. But this one here, it's kind of cool. You can basically mix two healing potions into one and give them double the healing. Level 10, merciful elixir, elixir of life removes fear. Level 12, extended elixir, you can make any duration um, until the next daily preparation. Greater Merciful Elixir, now Elixir of Life counters more effects. External Elixir, you can basically, uh, Eternal Elixir, make a mutagen permanent. And Improved Elixir, make potions into el elixirs. That's kind of all you get with the Shurigan, but it's still a pretty good class. Now we can look at the Toxicologist. So, Let's have a look at arsenic. This is a level 1 um, poison that you are going to get. You can see it actually has the consumable trait added onto it and the ingested trait. So once you pour this out, it is consumed. It also must be ingested for someone to take the effects. But you sneak into a goblin's lair and find their drinking source. You can uh, put arsenic in it and you can basically poison the entire tribe. You then have also at level one giant centipede venom. So this one here, once again consumable, so use. It is a poison, but it is now an injury tag instead of the ingested tag. So this means you can put it onto blow darts or onto your crossbow or onto pretty much any weapon you want. And you're going to be able to inflict um, damage for it. You can see here these are DC 7 and DC 18 fortitude. As a toxicologist this is going to increase. So your DC as a toxicologist at level 1 should be 17. Um, however level 2 that's going up to 18 so your giant centipede venom is going to a DC 18 fortitude and it's just going to go up from there making these viable at higher levels. 
So taking this, here is a level 7 hill giant, now based on, whoop, I don't know where the other notes I've put on, but basically based on general mathematics with um, upgrading to 19 intelligence at level 5, you are going to have a class DC of 23. That means if we go backwards to our arsenic, well this requires a DC of 18 in order to poison him. You can see here his fortitude save is 17. Effectively, if he rolls a 1, he's failing. Anything else, he's succeeding. You are now going to have a DC of 23. It's still not good odds, but he's now going to have to roll at least a 6 or higher in order to save. Still gives him about a 30% failure rate instead of a 5% failure rate. So that's why a toxicologist is actually quite good using their class DC. And the feats available for this is, level 1 you have subtle delivery, you can effectively deliver toxins via a blowgun. The good thing is, um, the notes for this say, even if you miss the damage with the blowgun, you can still apply the actual damage of the toxin. You then get tenacious toxin, increase the poison's duration. Sticky poison, a chance to keep the weapon poisoned. Uh, pinpoint Poisoner, give a penalty to flat-footed targets. Chemical Contagion, target the adjacent creature with the poison. And that's kind of all you get for them. So, you can see Toxicologist doesn't get a huge amount. The main key thing is what you get with your DCs, plus, you know, if you choose the two that we had a look at, um, Giant Centipede, Venom, and Arsenic, you're going to be able to make three of those per turn. Right, so the ancestries. What we're going to first look at is what ancestries there are. So a good choice has three points. It can get intelligence, constitution, and dexterity all at level one. An okay choice will have two points. So this is basically any ancestry where you can get any one of the two of them, preferably intelligence and either constitution or dexterity. A meh choice is one point. So that will be any ancestry that will have stuff like, I think orcs get a strength and one free. So you can choose intelligence, constitution, or dexterity. Obviously you're going to be choosing intelligence most of the time. Or it'll be races such as, um, I think the elf, you can get two of them, but you have a negative on constitution. So you can get dexterity and intelligence but you start with a negative on constitution, so that's a meh choice as an alchemist. And then bad choices are all the ancestries that have a negative to intelligence. So we're then going to look at the heritage. Heritages are basically any heritage that will give you a bonus on either your crafting or a bonus to resist the poison, basically stuff that will make a good alchemist. And finally, what ancestral feats are needed. So, bad choices first. We have the Leashy. You have an ability boost for Constitution, Wisdom, and Free. So you get Constitution and Dexterity, or Constitution or Intelligence. But you have an ability floor of Intelligence, meaning at level 1 you're stuck with a 16 Intelligence. And the next one is a Lizard Folk. You also have an ability floor in Intelligence quite funny because that obviously you can see there has a little tiny poison arrow so yep would not recommend those two races you can still play it there is no really bad bad choice um, my wife plays a goblin who is a druid and as you know goblins have a um, negative on their wisdom but yeah it's still a fun character you can make fun characters out of these these are just ones that I would not recommend then we go for the meh choices. So we have, I think I may have, uh, yeah, I didn't put any animations on these. I must have mixed up them. That's all right. Meh choices are your spider people. Basically, they have a floor to constitution, but they get dexterity and a free one. So you're going to have dexterity and intelligence, no constitution. Same with the kobold. And with the Shuni, all of them have a negative on constitution. And none of them have a bonus to intelligence, so you're going to be using your free one for intelligence. Then you have the Golma, Kitsune, and Orc. Basically, they only get two um, ability score increases, 
and none of them are intelligent so you're going to be using that for intelligence meaning you're missing out on the others all right okay choices so you have your dwarf which will give you a constitution and a free one so i would choose intelligence elf is an okay it really probably should have been in the meh choice because you do get a flaw to constitution but you get dexterity and intelligence so you can negate that flaw by get, giving yourself constitution that's kind of why i put it there um as a I don't know how to pronounce that. As a kitty, as a kitty, yeah. Um, that's your fish people. You have a flaw to wisdom and you have a bonus to constitution, so you want to choose intelligence. A gnome, you've got constitution and free and a flaw to strength. Halfling is dexterity and free and a bonus to strength, uh, weakness to strength. A knoll is intelligence and free, so you can choose either constitution or dexterity and a flaw to wisdom a grippy is a bonus to dexterity and free and a flaw to strength a corn corn rasu is a bonus to constitution and then intelligence and a flaw to charisma cat folk is dexterity with a negative to wisdom and goblin is dexterity with a negative to wisdom so all of these you can give yourself a bonus to intelligence and at least one other we also have a flesh warp so these are ones that have a bonus uh, they only have two increases but one of them is one of the chosen so a flesh warp is constitution fetchling is dexterity human you get two free ones a shisk you get an intelligence and a free these are porcupine people from the magwai expanse Strix is dexterity and free, and a Tengu is dexterity and free. So they are all pretty good. You're going to get to choose two of the three. The next ones are going to be your good choices, and for this we have the last four races available, which is your Android. You get dexterity, intelligence, and you can choose your constitution. You have a Hobgoblin, gives you constitution and intelligence. Obviously you can then choose dexterity. A rat folk gets you dexterity and intelligence with a flaw to strength. And the last one is a sprite, which gives you dexterity and intelligence with your next one being constitution you can choose. And your flaw is strength. As they don't use a lot of strength, they actually make a pretty decent um, toxicologist or a pretty decent shuriken because they have the ability to fly they can move pretty quick so yeah these are the races i would recommend if you are going to build one all right heritages these are all the heritages that actually get some sort of bonus that are going to help you so an artisan android effectively you become trained in crafting and you get the specialty craft and feat of your choice which you can then choose for alchemical crafting you have an anvil dwarf, you are pretty much the same thing, you're trained in crafting and you get the specialty crafting, however you get to choose two, so you can go with alchemical items and then an extra one, if you want to be the party repair you can choose blacksmithing, you want to make money doing gems or making art, go for that. And dwarfs get a second one, strong blooded dwarf, so this gives you a, um, you can shake off toxins, you gain a poison resistance equal to half your level, and each successful save and throw reduces the affliction by two instead of one. Alright, other heritages are a versatile human, effectively you can choose any general feat of your choice and that's going to open up a whole heap of really cool feats that you can choose um, for your poisoning or for healing or anything your crafting pretty much anything choose it at the end and you can go wild you've got a strong gut shisk this here is you can go one week without food before you begin to starve that's not really helpful um, additionally, the onset time and lengths of stages for all disease and poisons that you are affected by are increased by 50%. So if the on stage is instant or only lasts one round, it has no effect. It effectively reduces the, rate, uh, the length of time that a poison can last. 
and steel skin hobgoblin your flats check for recovering from persistent physical including bleed energy or poison damage is 13 rather than 15 or 8 with help so that's going to help you if you get poisoned by your own concoction you just need to roll a 13 or higher to ignore it okay finally we have a look at the ancestral feats that will help you so cleansing subroutine from the android lights line is your nanites help purge your body from chemicals and toxins so with a successful fortitude save you reduce each stage by two or by one against a virulent poison i just need to double check to make oh yeah okay uh, doot doot, why am I not clicking? There we go. And the dwarfs have eye for treasure. So this is going to give a craft a plus one bonus to craft and checks when you roll a recall knowledge. Um, you automatically become trained in crafting. Well, we're probably going to have that twice now, so that's going to give us two extra skill feats. And we get the uh, appraise skill feat, crafter's appraisal which is going to let us have a look at magical concoctions and know what it is. Okay, other ancestral feats is general training for your human, which gives you a first level general feat again, and then natural ambition, which gives you a first level class feat, meaning you can choose two particular class feats. The really good thing about um, at the sorry where am I going with this train of thought the really really good thing about all of your feats with your I'm totally lost in my train of thought here basically none of the class feats have a prerequisite you must choose this particular research path um, a lot of the stuff like a lot of the druids class feats require you to either be a um, wild druid or be a storm druid and stuff like this if you are choosing an al al alchemist, then you don't actually get limited. So, you know, all the feats will kick off. You can be a toxicologist and still take Far Bomber, or be a healer and still take the Blow Dart ability for the toxicologist. None of them are locked off. This is, means humans are extra better at choosing level 1 feats because there's nothing inherently bad about any of the feats and nothing locked behind a subclass rule. And the last one is the Ephorite Initiative Crafting, the Ephorite being the versatile heritage from the Axis of Lore. Um, your affinity with process and order makes you a natural artisan. You gain the prof trained proficiency rank in crafting and you gain specialty crafting. So fairly similar to a dwarf. All right, the last one is actually the Hobgoblin, and he's in the middle because he has two of them. So the first one is Alchemical Scholar. You learn the formulas more easily. You gain four common first level alchemical formulas. So this is going to put an alchemist up to 10 formulas they know at level one. And an alchemist usually gets two per level. Well, this is going to give you another one per level. Effectively, it means you're never going to have to buy a formula because you're starting off with 10 and you're getting 3 per level to choose from. That is a huge amount. At level 20, that's effectively going to be 80 formulas you know. T sorry, 70 formulas you know. And then Cantorian Reinforcement. The life energies that help you create the first Hobgoblins is particularly potent in you. Um, effectively, you're reducing the role for other stages for poisons by two. It's just going to help you get over poisons a lot quicker. So, based on that, what backgrounds are good? Well, artisan. You be a hobgoblin artisan, then you're going to be able to choose one must be strength or intelligence, and the other one is a free one, and you get specialty crafting. You can do this with any ancestry, but... This makes a decent background. The other one is an artist background. Once again, specialty crafting and dexterity or charisma. So you'll be choosing dex, then intelligence. You've got Mirabite Prodigy. This here, I believe, comes from the Golden Road um, 
guide for the Lost Diamonds World Guide. And you can choose Dexterity or Intelligence and a free one. And then you get Alchemical Lore and Specialty Crafting. This is going to be really good. Um, basically, you want to make any particular... Yeah, you can... It's just really good. Trust me, very good. And then Secular Medic. This is going to give you the Battlefield Medicine skill as well as the Anatomy Law skill. And you're trained in medicine. Okay. Uh, Al Kenstar Tinkerer, your dedication to scientific inquiry of your native Al Kenstar provides you with great insight to the mechanical and chemical innovation. So you get dexterity or intelligence in a free one, and you then get engineering law and alchemical crafting. Not really super helpful, but it's a decent one to look at. And then a Shori Seeker from the Magwai Expanse. You've dedicated your life to unraveling the secrets of the ancient Shori Empire. Basically, you get crafting, Shori law skill, and specialty crafting. And then once again, dexterity or intelligence. So those are just examples. There are so many different backgrounds you can choose from. I really like the Merabite Prodigy, simply because it's one of the few that give alchemical law. But yeah, your choice as to whichever one you want. Final build we can have a look at our strong blooded dwarf so your free ability you're going to choose will be intelligence you're going to choose the dwarven feet that's not the dwarven feet um, you're going to choose the heritage of eye for treasure and oh no no you're a strong blooded dwarf that's your heritage duh your dwarven feet will be eye for treasure and you can either choose dwarven lore to give you some more lore skills or clan's edge to give you a bonus on using your dagger and your background will probably be field medic or you could be a hobgoblin given your free ability to dexterity your that says dwarven feet i just copied and pasted bad bad mistake but your hobgoblin feet will be alchemical scholar given you 10 different um, alchemical formulas at level 1, your ancestral paragon feat will be Cantorian reinforcement, and your background will be Merabite prodigy. So based off all of that, why don't we actually look at building a character inside Wanderer's Guide. So we're going to make this one a good alchemist. I, I added an 8. We're going to keep him to level 1. Well, you are going to activate all of the usual things that I let my players play with. Dice integration, auto heightened spells. Then we're going to go ancestral and free archetype. So, what particular one are we going to make here? Well, by popular demand, basically I have a friend who loves dwarfs. So he has chosen to go with a dwarf. Okay, with this dwarf, we are going to choose intelligence. So we're going to have wisdom, constitution, and intelligence. We're going to have a bit of a dip in dexterity, but that's all good. Our heritage is going to be strong-blooded dwarf. Our first ancestry feat is going to be eye for treasure. So that's going to give us a plus one on recall knowledge. And we gain the craft as appraisal skill feat. And then the next one I'm going to choose will be clan's edge. Okay, so background for this dwarf, if you wanted one, basically he grew up working in his father's forge. He grew up, you know, helping his father out. Just He got a really good eye for crafting and all that sort of stuff. Um, he did notice every time some sort of disease hit the area he was in, you know, it happens. And most of the people would get sick, most of the dwarfs, even though dwarfs have a high constitution, him and his family never really got sick that much. So he was kind of, you know, he just took it in his stride and carried on chugging along. He then, when he came to age, he got gifted his clan dagger, and he proudly joined the dwarven defense forces inside the Five, Mount, uh, five King Mountain range. So it's pretty much protecting the underground highways between the different cities from orc incursions and all that sort of stuff. One day he was um, doing his patrol with his unit when the wall collapsed and out came a horde 
of pretty much whatever you wanted. It would have been Drow Elf or no Droger, the big giant dwarfs that you know cars cast enlarge on themselves. Um, his force was losing the battle badly. He was still a pretty new rookie, so it was pretty much they were going to die. But one thing changed their life. The um, local garrison sent some reinforcements to help protect the battle and one of those people was this old withered dwarf that looked so skin and bones you could mistake him for a short elf or a really underfed halfling and yeah this dwarf basically moved up the front of the line he went and was administering all sorts of potions to dwarfs and the dwarfs would be able to jump back up and stack in with the fight but this giant droger came out shouting and scaring all of the dwarfs this tiny little dwarf just walked up to him and laughed in his face he then turned around um, grabbed two potions from his belt chugged them down then suddenly all these massive muscles started growing on him he turned around and literally tore this droger to pieces anytime the droger got a hit in it would pretty much heal instantaneously you know a sharp dagger to the shoulder would make a spout of blood and then the wound would knit together after the battle um, he pulled out some more little flasks from his pouch and threw them at the hole they hit the hole and exploded and collapsed the hole well this dwarf that we are building he saw the battle he was very impressed with that and asked to join those forces and apprentice under the sky so the guy let him and from that he still learned how to fight a bit um, actually based on that we're not going to take clan's edge we're going to take dwarven weapon familiarity so he's you know he was trained to use a war hammer in the army but it didn't really sink in he absolutely loved the way this dwarven alchemist was just able to completely control the battlefield and he wanted to go out healing all the other dwarfs you know go out win the battle for the dwarfs and then heal wherever he could so he chose his background is going to be a medic I believe there is medic there field medic this gives him battlefield medicine this gives him warfare lore so you know trained in warfare trained in the use of warhammer but also trained frontline medicine being able to give potions and stuff however should it be needed he can take a mutagen and augment his combat ability so he can stay up the front with the rest of the dwarfs his abilities is going to be constitution for his hardiness and intelligence we are then going to have a class obviously alchemist we're going to go down choose a skill we've already got trained in crafting and medicine and warfare law so we're going to be trained in society most dwarfs know about dwarven society okay we've got quick alchemy we don't need much of that we've got the formula book we're going to choose a research field and we're going with a shuriken so that is going to give us two of these and whenever we build our particular uh, whenever we make a minor elixir of life instead we're going to get three minor elixirs so you can see here you create three items instead of two with your signature alchemy we are then going to go through with our alchemist feet and it doesn't really matter these here aren't super important but if you want to go down the lore knowledge i would look at alchemical savant and then the ability choices obviously intelligence we're going to go for another strength we're going to go for another constitution and another dexterity right to finalize we have all these languages it really doesn't matter i mean yeah we'll go under common we'll go terran and i'm thinking every dwarf loves to swear at people in giant speak and you got to know orcish in order to insult the orcs better then for the rest of our skills we are going to go with a little bit of acrobatics a little bit of athletics now we don't have much charisma so there's no point in that we do have decent wisdom so we're going to go survival we're going to go religion we are going to go arcana with our intelligence and then the other intelligence one i believe is yeah nature and occultism finalize this character 
did I click I did click it and here we have our good alchemist the very first thing we always want to do is we always want to buy ourselves an adventurer's kit we always want to move these out of our pack to unsorted so we can stick things on our belt the other thing oh I moved you into their belts didn't I that's silly a belt pouch and a belt pouch we also get ourselves a free book which is a formula book and then the last thing we get for free is if we go to weapon we get a clan dagger for free everything else we have to pay for so we can go for a warhammer uh, warhammer here we go we're going to buy ourselves a warhammer now sadly we only have 10 strength um, I would like to have a bit more strength for better armor but it is going to limit what armor we can have I don't think we can go with hide armor I think it is a chain shirt is the best armor yeah that's got that so we're going to buy that we need to buy two things so I think they are under tools or other um, alchemist tools we're going to buy some alchemist tools and we'll keep them on our person and then we need to buy one more item for tools which is your healers tools did I didn't buy that did I No, healers tools buy why is that not letting me buy because I only have 45 silver oh that's a bit weird um, okay tool we are going to give ourselves a healing tool yeah we'll do that and just say we got it for cheap going to put the chain shirt on it's not going to give us a high dexterity and as you can see our warhammer we don't have a very high to hit but that doesn't matter we are the frontline medic so with that we want to go to our chemical items we want to go to elixirs so we are going to get the elixir of life going to give ourselves the formula for that we want to get the other two elixirs so antidote and anti-plague now with that I also think the dragon heart mutagen is going to be good and the bestial mutagen so that is five of them the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go to a bomb and give yourself bottled lightning I really like that then we just put you into the formula book takes a little bit of time I'd hate to be a actual crafter and have a hundred or so items into there because you'll have to do this individually and there we go we go to our formula book these are all the formulas we can make we have our healers tools and our alchemist potion so we are all pretty good for building our character this is it's not the best healer but it actually will you know it's probably just as good as if you were to choose a cleric and yeah i quite like the sound of this dwarf so thank you very much for watching it has been fun to build this character and yeah use it enjoy it and thank you we will make another one next week